buddy, I'm trying to record. I, I try to spend all day with you, and you run away, and now I try to record, and you immediately start... Oh my god. What's up? Why do you want attention now? Why are you licking the table? You're just gonna sit there and drink lemon juice the entire time I'm doing this? Yeah, of course you are. Whatever. Roll the intro, please. Welcome to the Best Prospects That You've Never Heard Of series, part two. In case you missed part one, this is a series where I break down five different prospects that honestly maybe you have heard of before. I mean, some of these guys are going to go in the top 50 picks, so it's not like they're secrets. But I do think that they are undervalued relative to how good I think they really are. So in the end, I guess you can consider it more of an underrated prospect series, part two. We're going to kick this thing off at number five on our countdown with an inside linebacker prospect that honestly came into the University of Michigan with a lot of fanfare and a lot of hype, but his career didn't really go the way that maybe we all expected it would at Michigan. He didn't really get a whole lot of playing time early, and then the last season of his career, 2020, his true junior season, was kind of marred by injury and he didn't really get a whole lot of snaps. So as a result of that, I guess you'd call it relative anonymity for a four or five star recruit. He kind of fell away from the spotlight of draft coverage, if you will, and a lot of people just kind of forgot about him. In fact, I hadn't even watched him yet when I made the first episode of this series back in February, so I didn't really have any comments on him myself. But when I finally did get around to grading what tape I could get my hands on, most of it coming from the 2019 season where he was actually healthy, he actually ended up as my second highest graded linebacker in this entire class, even ahead of Jamin Davis, who I broke down in the first episode of this series. And of course, that's just a long way for me to introduce the monster in the middle of the Michigan defense, linebacker Cam McGrone. McGrone has all of the hallmarks of a top 50 pick at linebacker. He's incredibly fast from sideline to sideline and can shut down the edge run game in a blur. He's got great instincts against the run inside as well and doesn't really get caught out of position as much as some other highly regarded linebacker prospects in this class. And he's also much more physical than most linebackers his size are. He's about 6 foot 235 for reference and he gets off blocks really well considering his frame. Plus, although he doesn't have a whole lot of experience in coverage, you can still see that he moves extremely fluidly in space, and I think he has a ton of room to grow in that area as well. In terms of build, skill set, and potential, he looks a lot to me like an even faster version of Eric Kendricks, which I know is very high praise. And hell, considering what the Kendricks contract looks like in the next few years, and considering the Vikings cap situation, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Minnesota draft McGrone as an understudy to Kendricks to potentially take over in 2022 or 2023. Now, even though I do think that on tape McGrone is a top 50 player in this class, I'm also realistic in thinking that he probably won't go anywhere near that range in the actual draft. As I said earlier, he's still coming off of multiple injuries sustained last season where his only actual healthy game was against Minnesota, which of course he dominated in, but because there's no combine this year to do medical checks and because he was still not healthy enough to do pro day testing last week, I still think that there's a good chance he slips into late day two or perhaps even day three. Overall, McGrone is an extremely undervalued linebacker in this class that, for various reasons, will go much lower than he should. And that's great news for whatever his future team in the NFL is going to be, because I think they're going to be getting a starting caliber player for, likely, a dirt cheap cost. 
Next up on our list is another Michigan man, ironically, wide receiver Nico Collins, who also kind of fell out of the draft spotlight in 2020 because he didn't really play either. In fact, he didn't play at all because he opted out for the 2020 season due to concerns with the pandemic, which I don't blame him for at all, and he decided that he was just going to leave college football and train on his own for the draft during his true senior season, and then he ended up going to the Senior Bowl anyway, even without playing in 2020. He dominated the one-on-ones down in Mobile, and ironically, in my opinion, he raised his draft stock without even playing in any games. Going back to Collins' 2019 tape in his junior season, he profiled at that time as your typical big, somewhat slow jump ball receiver in the mold of like an Alshon Jeffrey. You know those kinds of receivers that are quote unquote open even when they're not open and they just dominate with ball skills and physicality and all that, which don't get me wrong, that's totally fine and there is a place for that in the league. But at the Senior Bowl, after Nico dropped 10 to 15 pounds and played lighter, we saw a new aspect to his game that we hadn't seen before. He was much more sudden in and out of his breaks, he had an actual element of vertical speed and could separate with an extra gear over the top that he didn't have before, and he had that newfound twitchiness while still retaining the ball skills, physicality, and competitiveness that were all his calling cards in the past. After that weight drop, Collins now profiles as a 6'4", 215-pound receiver that catches everything. He has a little bit of route running acumen, he jumps 37 and a half inches, and he runs 4'4'3". That's pretty damn good, and you're going to get that guy sometime on day two of the draft outside of the first seven or eight receivers taken, when in most receiver classes that are not quite this loaded, he would likely be one of the first five or six off the board. It's tough to say exactly where he's going to go in the draft because even among teams that need receivers, they're all looking for different shapes and sizes and roles, so it's honestly really hard to predict anything. But I do really like Collins as a prospect, especially now compared to what he looked like in 2019, and I think he has a chance to be one of the diamonds in the rough of really this entire draft class. Now, number three on my list is a name that some of you might actually recognize because UCLA defensive lineman Osa Adigizua, his older brother Oa Adigizua was actually drafted by the Giants all the way back in 2015. He was a highly athletic defensive end prospect that unfortunately had his career derailed after only a couple years due to a string of really unfortunate injuries. But his little brother Osa is also a really, really good player and I also expect him to get drafted sometime on day two just like his older brother. Osa has a really interesting profile because he's on the shorter and lighter side for most 3-4 defensive ends at about 6'2", 280 but he's got over 34 inch arms. So when you combine his natural leverage from his shortness with that length and his raw strength, he's actually a really hard guy to move off the line of scrimmage. I think he's a natural fit as a five technique defensive end in a three four scheme because he's such a stubborn run defender, but he also offers some versatility as a pass rusher too in nickel packages. He's really quicker than you think, and when he actually uses his length and strings together pass rush moves with a plan instead of just winging it with a bull rush, he's very tough to block. I think he has fascinating upside as a sub package rusher for 3-4 teams that like to sub out their nose tackles and nickel and dime, and in a way his skill set kind of reminds me of a young Stefan Tuitt who was also more of a projection than a sure thing when he was coming out of Notre Dame back in 2014. He's smaller than Tuit, obviously, but they play the same way, which I guess kind of makes sense considering the Steelers have been reportedly talking to Odigizua a lot this draft season, perhaps maybe looking to add him as another piece to that already dominant defensive line. Pittsburgh is of course a perfect schematic fit for every reason I laid out here, but really any team that wants a five technique defensive end on early downs that might be able to play three technique on passing downs will be interested in Osa's services. And for that reason, I can't imagine he gets taken any lower than the third round. His upside, at least to me, is far too valuable to slip any lower than that. Next up on our list is a guy who honestly has a pretty decent chance to go in the first round, so I guess you could say he's not really quote unquote underrated, but I think the fact that Creed Humphrey from Oklahoma is a center and not a tackle or a guard means that he might actually fly under the radar for a lot of people who don't really pay attention to the center position. 
Humphrey comes from a family of champion wrestlers, and he himself started wrestling when he was only four years old, and all of that wrestling experience really shows up on tape. He's a master of leverage, balance, and angles, and even though he's not one of the biggest guys himself, he was able to handle much larger defensive linemen than him in pass protection because he really knows how to dig in and make the most of that natural leverage advantage. He's also got really loose hips and quick feet that make him a phenomenal fit in zone run games where having a center that can effectively reach block is a big priority in order to create those running lanes on the front side of the play. And I think there are no fewer than three teams in the top 32 picks that could be looking at him just for that reason alone because zone run games need good centers in order to function. And yes, I'm looking at you, Green Bay. Beyond just being a dominant run blocker though, and as solid a pass protector as they come, Humphrey is also very experienced in calling protections, picking up blitzes and all that kind of stuff, and I think he could easily step onto an NFL field and be able to communicate and diagnose defenses from day one. To me, Humphrey is one of the best 32 football players in this draft, so it would be a shame to see him drop out of the first round. But just knowing the value of the position he plays, I could see him easily slip into the second round, which is good for all the teams that are there at the top of the second round that need centers, because I think no matter what, Creed is going to be a really great pro, and whatever team he does go to really won't have to worry about their center position for probably the next 10 years. Now, before we get into our number one player on this list, and arguably my biggest sleeper of this entire draft season, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this week, Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium tailored men's grooming brand that is making it easier for guys to look, smell, and feel their best. All you have to do is take a quick quiz online at Hawthorne's website where they ask you questions on everything from your type of skin, to your type of hair, to your favorite fragrance, and of course your favorite drink, and they'll come up with a personalized list of products from their catalog that fit your needs, and from there you can pick which ones you want and which ones you don't. I can speak from personal experience that I've been relying heavily on their face lotion the last couple days because if you can't tell, I burned the shit out of my face on a fishing trip last weekend, and this face lotion is one of the only things that's made it feel better. Probably because it has aloe in it, but uh, I can't recommend it enough. It hydrates, it kind of just makes it stop feeling itchy and dry and gross and painful, and uh, yeah, really good stuff. If you take the quiz yourself and decide that there are some products you want to try, Hawthorne takes all of the risk out of it because you get free shipping on your order and on any returns, and if you don't even like your products, they'll retailer them for you based on your feedback. I really think you guys should give Hawthorne a shot. It's one of my favorite partnerships to have on this channel, mainly because I have an excuse to keep getting their products because I love them so much. I've used them for about a year now and I really can't speak highly enough about them. If you see anything of theirs that you wanna buy yourself, you can go to my link at the description below. That is hawthorne.co. Use promo code filmroom10 and that will get 10% off your order. Again, link down below in the description, filmroom.co, promo code filmroom10 for 10% off your order. And with that being said, let's move on to our number one player on this list, Jamar Johnson, safety out of Indiana. If you watched my four hour long live stream a few weeks ago where I broke down Justin Fields against the very potent Indiana defense, you saw me fall in love with Jamar Johnson that day in real time. He was everywhere in that game, doing literally everything. Patrolling the post, getting involved in run support, blitzing his ass off on third downs. I mean, he was a nightmare for Ohio State to deal with. And I think the thing that really stuck out the most to me when I watched that tape were the mind games that he was playing with Fields both before and after the snap. I mean, just as a quick example, he would fake like he was going to back up and play in a deep half and a too high shell just to kind of bait Justin Fields into sticking with a run call into that too high shell, only to then come down late and fill the alley and completely shut down that run. He would also casually stay down low before the snap and act like he was going to play a hook zone, only to then bail deep after the snap. He would act like he was going to be a robber over the middle and then come free on a blitz. I mean, Fields had no idea what Johnson was going to do on every single play because he was just that sneaky. And I guess that's the best way to describe him. He is a sneaky master of disguise and really, really smart. And when you package that super high football IQ with his short area quickness, his physicality and toughness, and his ball skills, 
he's got almost everything you want in a modern safety. Now, his long speed and his vertical explosiveness are just average at best, so I don't know about playing him as like a full-time free safety in the deep middle, a la Jesse Bates or Minka Fitzpatrick. That's probably not his best fit. But truth be told, if you're playing him full-time in the deep middle, I feel like that's a waste of his skill set anyway. I want him to be down low and around the ball as much as possible, because when he's around the ball, good things happen. Jamar Johnson is a tremendous football player in all the subtle ways that really count. And I think no matter where he goes in the NFL, he's going to be successful because smart guys that are also tough as nails, that are also also at least above average athletes, tend to have very long and very fruitful careers. And that about wraps it up for this, uh, I guess you can call it underrated prospect series. I don't really have any rhyme or reason to it yet, but I just wanted to make sure that I got to talk about as many prospects as I could this year and not just the top 15 to 20 guys. So hopefully this series can kind of help accomplish that goal and hopefully you guys enjoy watching them as much as I enjoy making them. And with that, I'm sure we will be back later this week with even more content, especially all the content that I'm releasing over on my second channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast channel. I've released two podcasts this week, a huge interview with O-line guru Brandon Thorne, and I'm doing a pretty long Q&A draft live stream on Friday, so go check out that channel for that as well. Um, I'm going to attend to my cat, who is being the neediest creature on planet Earth, so I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week, and until next time, cheers. <laughs> oh my god, this whole thing has been a disaster. Whatever, I'll see you guys later. Fuck.